Okay. <clears throat> so there we are live on Facebook. Hello, everybody. I am Sadahad Nisar Hi. from Faisalabad Hub in Pakistan. And I am here again with another COVID-19 live session. Today, we will focus on the uh, East Asian region. And for this, I have Sahib from Singapore with me and Amy from Kuala Lumpur. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, um, a quick uh, recap to all the people who were looking forward to watch the Europe session. So we had a minor technical issue. That's why we uh, couldn't stream live on Facebook. So we will be uploading the webinar soon on the Facebook page. Okay, um, without any delay, delays, I would like to start the uh, conversation. So we are here to talk about COVID-19, also referred to coronavirus. So it had started in 2019, December, and it was discovered in Wuhan. And currently it's all around the world. So um, Sahib, I would like to start with you. Can you tell me something about the current situation in Singapore regarding the virus? Sure, absolutely. Um, look, first of all, I think it's fair to say that the situation in Singapore uh, is, is probably better than in most countries around the world today. Um, not necessarily in terms of the number of cases, but I think overall in terms of how the situation is being dealt with. Um, so Singapore currently today has around 730 cases. Um, mm -hmm. We're currently going through, I guess, a second wave. Um, you know, from the beginning of January, we were probably having about under five cases per day. Um, in uh, the early February, we were having about five to 10 cases, new cases per day. Um, in early March, we we're having about 10 to 20 cases per day, but we are now seeing around 50 to 70 new cases per day in Singapore. Um, so there has definitely been a spike oh. uh, in the number of cases in Singapore. And this is largely mm -hmm. driven by a couple of things. One is, um, new uh, in basically there's been a lot of imported cases so um singaporeans returning home from the uk or america um and and we've caught the virus uh in those countries and have now brought it into singapore uh and there's also now been also i guess a few clusters of cases that have developed within singapore local singaporeans uh that are now kind of spreading um but what is i think what is fair to say is that uh, the Singaporean government has been very good in terms of its communication uh, and also in mm -hmm. terms of its ability to track the, the cases uh, once they're confirmed. Um, I'll stop there. Uh, yeah. Okay, good to know. Amy, what's the current situation in Kuala Lumpur? Well, currently in Kuala Lumpur, um, it's still manageable, but we do see a spike, like probably since the last week. Um, but mm -hmm. it's uh, our hospital occupancy rate is about, if I'm not mistaken, it's about like 40%, which is still like we are running still on optimum level. Um, what happened in KL is that uh, in Malaysia in general, there was just a few cases. Our first wave, we only had like 20. 23 cases and then after that it kind of escalated when there were a few um, clusters that came up like one was um, a CEO of a major company he came back from his travels and like that he became like some sort of a super trader and there was like a large religious gathering that was that also helped in um, contributing to the number of um, increase in uh, the statistics. Uh, but overall, we are currently in a lockdown. We have been in lockdown since eight, uh, 18th of March. Sorry, um, the right word would be uh, restrictions of movement. Uh, it's not a lockdown. Uh, what happened is um, non-essential businesses are asked to cease operation. Um, and then Malaysians are not allowed to go out unless to um, do some necessary um, like necessary items like running to the groceries or like doing some of the financial um, transactions but even then like right now it, it's closed 
um, and yeah, pretty much um, restrictive movement. And it was supposed to end on 31st of March, but after day seven of MCO, um, the government announced to uh, extend it to 14th of April. So altogether, we will be on an MCO for 28 days. Uh, for now, things are pretty all right. Like it's still, um, uh, it's still manageable. We our healthcare system is um, really great at, at this point of time in uh, trying to get, uh, trying to find all this. Um, possible people getting uh, everyone to uh, adhere to the social distancing and uh, getting more people tested out. So yeah, that's about it in Indonesia. Uh -huh, okay, so um, uh, before continuing, I would like to encourage our viewers, if you have any questions, you can ask me, ask on the Facebook live stream right now, and I will convey your messages to these people, and I'm sure we can uh, give you a reasonable answer. So yeah, um, it's like in Pakistan, it's kind of the same as Sahib said that uh, the uh, virus itself came, uh, was carried by a lot of travelers and especially from those people who travel from Iran to Pakistan. And um, it's uh, approximated that up to 78% of the cases came from Iran. So yeah, that's the current situation in Pakistan. We have two provinces who are uh, hardly hit by the uh, by the virus. Those are Punjab and Thin. And like approximately, I guess there are over a thousand cases right now in Pakistan. Yeah. So um, moving on, uh, Sahib, I would like to continue with you. Can you tell me about what measures the government has taken uh, there in uh, Singapore? Mm. Sure. Yeah. So look, I think, um, one of the first things to say here is that the Singaporean government was very quick to react to the to the virus, right? Um, so as soon as they kind of saw the situation was arising in Wuhan uh, in early January, uh, they they kind of Sing Singaporean government um, tried to uh, begin preparing uh, and started ramping up its laboratory capacity for, for mass testing. And they started ramping up its, mm -hmm. uh, their manufacturing for the testing kits. Um, mm -hmm. And I think that's paid a lot of dividends in terms of uh, you know, keeping this situation under relative control. Uh, okay. So you know, one, one statistic uh, that we can use here is that you know, Singapore does roughly 6,800 examinations per million uh, people in the population. Mm -hmm. uh, and that rate is, is higher than, than pretty much any other country around the world. It's higher than in Korea, South Korea, which is around 6,100 tests, right? So the, 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 the early testing and the number of testing, the amount of testing that happens in Singapore is, is, is outpaced pretty much any other country. Uh, I think another thing that has really helped is, um, you know, the Singaporean government's communication strategy. Uh, so from the very early days, uh, the Singaporean government created this WhatsApp chat uh, where every day uh, the government communicates, communicated to the Singaporean citizens exactly what was going on in uh -huh. terms of the number of new cases, uh, in terms of uh, what was happening in, in the economy, uh, you know, whether or not they should um, they should, you know, be going out and, and, and buying more food. Um, and, you know, that kind of communication strategy, being very transparent with the, with, with the people, uh, but at the same time, keeping people calm, uh, I think has meant that, you know, uh, Singaporeans and, and expats have felt more comforted. Mm -hmm. And have also been relatively obedient in terms of social distancing. So that I think that has, has made a big difference. Um, and I think the final thing to say here is that the Singaporean government um, has done a lot of contact tracing. So uh, as many of you would probably know, uh, the Singaporean government obviously has a lot of um, CCTV cameras around the place. So as soon as 
you know, uh, you're tested positive uh, for the coronavirus, uh, the government would basically use um, any kind of footage that it has available to try and trace all of the people that you would have had contact with. Uh, and I guess the second way in which it's the government has done this contact tracing is that very recently, uh, the government has, has developed an app, uh, an application which people uh, are encouraged to download on their mobile phones. And how it works is effectively there is a, um, it works with a Bluetooth signal and records the distance between users uh, and the duration of their encounters. Uh, so what this effectively means is that if you are tested positive with the coronavirus, the government would then be able to log into uh, your, your uh, movements around Singapore and see whoever you've had um, contact with for a significant period of time and then basically send them a notice to quarantine themselves for around two weeks. And what that effectively does is uh, it means that, you know, people can still go up, uh, the, you know, most people can still uh, kind of leave their homes if they need to. Um, and so we are not under a full lockdown, but people who have had contact with someone with, a, uh, with the coronavirus, they do need to quarantine themselves. So I think the Singaporean government has, has done a relatively good job of balancing, get, keeping the economy going and, and allowing people to still leave their homes, uh, but at the same time, uh, isolating people who may have had contact with, with confirmed coronavirus cases. Um, I think this strategy works particularly well for Singapore because uh, Singapore is, 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 is uh, you know, a, a predominantly a one, a one party state. And, and people yeah. are relatively obedient. Um, so that's worked relatively well. Um, so yeah, you know, I think for all of those reasons, I think um, the government has taken the right sort of steps and actions, and that is why the situation is relatively under more control. Um, mm -hmm. But it is still yet to be seen um, whether or not uh, the number of new cases over the next few weeks continues to accelerate. It's pretty interesting because the mayors, uh, the government in Singapore has taken a uh, are like uh, I heard for the first time, like um, you said, personal tracing and uh, sorry, contact tracing and WhatsApp group. I, I think the WhatsApp group was a pretty nice idea because uh, what I felt in Pakistan was like when the first cases came in and it get more official that uh, we are getting into the crisis too, that people uh, started having trust issues uh, with the information provided to them. Like, is it, uh, is it true? Is it not true? People suspected more cases. People didn't know like the real numbers. So I think that WhatsApp group and uh, what your government has implemented was a great idea. And I see it now, uh, WHO has a, a similar WhatsApp group where you can just message hi and you will get the information. So I think that's uh, something, it's, it's good if you can communicate to the public because uh, they really need someone they can talk to because this is a really serious issue and people are getting really like panicked about this. Yeah, and I think apart from that, that contact tracing is a pretty good idea, but I think it's just possible because Singapore is that one part of state, as you mentioned, in uh, larger countries like Pakistan or uh, Malaysia itself, I think it's something more difficult. But yeah, great to hear that. It's something new and different, I hear. Yeah, Amy, what can you tell us about um, Kuala Lumpur? What have you observed? What measures has the government taken there? Well, I think I'm just going to split it into three um, items. One is um, on the healthcare approach and then the communications approach, as well as the economics, like what are the government doing? So on the healthcare side, we, we are pretty similar with Singapore. And it's probably because like we, we work closely together, both of our government. We do, we did do contact, trust, uh, contact tracing, sorry. Actually, we still do, in fact. Um, it's just that the number of cases has grown, so it's getting harder and harder for us to do con uh, contact tracing. Um, and on top of that, we have yet to do some mass um, testing, but um, our testings currently are um, sufficient to control the situation. Um, and on top of that, uh, the public 
uh, healthcare is working very closely together with our private healthcare. So um, from what I understand right now, um, there will be some cases um, from the public hospitals that will be diverted to the uh, private hospitals so that the public healthcare can focus on containing the um, pandemic. So mm -hmm. that's um, one thing that they're doing. And then they're um, looking into, they've already done this actually, um, assets, uh, government uh, buildings uh, mm -hmm. will be turned into um, quarantine centers and um, like satellite hospitals if our, uh, our hospitals could not take in the capacity mm -hmm. anymore. Um, but right now, uh, it seems like it's, it's still good, but um, social distancing is, is quite important. And then on the communication, um, I feel that on hindsight, uh, timing is very important because when uh, the government announced MCO, there was a little bit of like a rush of people panic buying and then some people decided to, you know, this is the time for us to go back to our hometowns, which is not the best idea because, you know, you're taking out like people who are in highly concentrated, uh, highly concentrated areas. Um, and then they might, might not have COVID. We just don't know whether they're symptomatic or not. And then they're going out to the um, other states or to the rural areas and possibly infecting. We do not know yet because we are just in day 10 and then um, probably some people have yet to show any symptoms. So it's we, we are um, just one or two weeks will be like the deciding factor for us. Uh, but moving on from that first, you know, first um, sort of like on hindsight what they should have done better. Um, currently, the communication is very, if I were to use one word, it would be uniformed. What I mean by that is um, everything is scheduled, so it gives a sense of um, security for the people. What I mean by that is they only have three main talking heads the PM, the uh, Director General of Health, and um, possibly the, um, uh, the head of uh, our Malaysian Security Council. So, and they will always come up with um, the press conference at the same time. So we all can expect um, like a certain kind of updates at a certain amount, uh, of, at, a, at a certain time period. Um, mm -hmm. And then on top of that, uh, we also have a telegram um, channel that was done by the government. So there's um, two main sources um, for COVID that we can get. One is from the uh, Ministry of Health. And another one is from the um, Safety Council of Malaysia. So I think in total, there will there are about like 2 million subscribers for mm -hmm. the telegram channel. Um, that's that's something that they do and it's almost like 20, 24 hours that they're like sharing information. Mm -hmm. um, we also have uh, hotlines for people if they do need assistance um, for different ministers, uh, ministries. And okay. as well as we also have set up um, a mental health hotline for people who might be, you know, having cabin fever or having anxiety, like people are not sure about what's going to happen with, I mean, would they be having an income like next month or something like that? Yeah. So we are preparing for that. So um, that's one communication. Uh, in fact, like I'm uh, currently assisting like in a voluntary group of um, a coalition of medical professionals. It's about 40,000 medical professionals strong and like the whole objective of what we're doing is to spread awareness mm -hmm. to all Malaysians and it's not just people who can go through social media but we're mm -hmm. trying to get to the grassroots as well but um, the challenge is you you have to do it virtually <laughs> But um, yeah, we're looking to that. And um, oh, finally, economic wise, uh, the government just announced like couple, um, yesterday, yeah, yesterday that they are um, injecting 250 billion ringgit for economic stimulus. And um, part of the package is they're giving us free internet for um, the duration of the MCO. We are okay. getting discounts for our elect uh, electricity bills. 
and mm -hmm. then um, for the economic stimulus, they're also giving um, like cash handouts to uh, the B40s and the M40s of the, the population. Uh, we're giving what else? Um, some uh, or oh, deferment of loan for six months. Um, uh, and there were a few others, but everything was like it, it, were, it came about to 250 billion ringgit. Um, well, it does help for um, looking at to, to pad like the potential economic impact to uh, mm -hmm. the population at large. We have yet to see if there would be any more announcement for small businesses, small and medium enterprises, which would probably be hurt like the most after, after you know, everything has settled. So mm -hmm. we are still seeing about that. Yeah, it's, it's great to see how uh, the governments all around the world actually have taken initiative uh, in this situation and how they are implementing uh, those measures. And um, obviously, one of the most important one is social distancing. And um, apart from that, um, the lockdown and um, controlling on the public. So uh, what I have observed in Pakistan is that uh, our public didn't cooperate it as much as they should because I really appreciate how the government here has um, started uh, like putting effort in it and it's really really effective and uh, is really aiming to get some uh, positive output and uh, implementing something which they can which they can save the public but the public um, is not as much uh, responding as they might so um, I want to know, Sahib, if you can tell me something about the public in uh, Singapore. How did they react to all the restrictions and measures? Yeah, it's, it's a great question. So, um, look, I'd say overall, the public has been, the public's reaction to, to the government's um, activities in, on controlling this virus has been generally very positive. Uh, I think you know, most of the people I've come across in Singapore are very, feel very privileged to be living uh, in, a, in a state like Singapore. Uh, when, you know, when you look around the rest of the world and see uh, what else is happening and, and how the situation is spiraling out of control, I think generally, myself included, uh, most people feel very privileged. Um, I'd say that, look, uh, this virus has, is affecting uh, people, uh, certain groups of people, a lot more than others, right? Yeah. So a lot of um, a lot of SMEs, uh, a lot of food and beverage businesses, um, mm -hmm. a lot of migrant workers, uh, you know, who are employed in construction sites. Uh, they, I think, are seeing. Um, you know, the most disruption to their daily lives uh, and to their to their incomes and, and well-being. Mm -hmm. uh, I think the, the good thing is that the Singaporean government has reacted to that and, yeah. um, you know, has announced a $55 billion stimulus package, uh, which is around 11% of, of the economy's GDP. Uh, as a proportion of GDP, I think that's one of the largest uh, of any of, it, uh, of many countries around the world in terms of stimulus packages. So I think the government has recognized that they need to, um, you know, stimulate the economy and, 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 and help out people in, in disadvantaged situations right now. Uh, and I think that's very important. Um, so look, overall, I'd say that people uh, are scared and, and, and as they are pretty much anywhere else in the world. Uh, but I'd say that people generally have uh, a lot of faith that the government is, is doing its best in handling the situation. Uh, and I think that the, the, the fact that the government has announced such a large stimulus package to try and keep the economy going and also help out people who need it the most uh, and also the healthcare facilities I think that is giving a lot of people a lot of confidence. Okay, so uh, it's great actually to hear that there is uh, so much uh, trust within the government and the public. 
So, um, Amy, uh, how is it in uh, Kuala Lumpur? What have you observed? Uh, how the public responds to all these measures? I think at first there's a lot of confusion and looking for a sense of like an authority figurehead, like the first two, probably the first two, three days. Um, that has probably impacted um, the thing on social distancing because our social distancing at one point, it was just the first two days was just about 60% to 70%. But um, after that, um, to, to get the logistics going, we included, uh, we included the help of our army. And um, after that, it has actually risen up to about 95 to like two days, 97%. Um, mm -hmm. adherence to social distancing. So I think mm -hmm. having a sense of authority in like physical places does um, help to, to help with social distancing. Um, people are generally, the thing with Malaysians is that we probably conform to a lot of societal pressure. So mm -hmm. the, first, the first one or two days, what happened was there was still um, a few people that are out on the streets, right? It's just 60%. But interesting mm -hmm. enough, I think it's the name and shame thing on like social media. Mm -hmm. And okay. like everyone just like collectively started, you know, criticizing people who are still out and then putting pressures. You have influencers coming up with memes and like, talking yeah. out in videos and then asking people to like you know what are you doing like stay at home mm -hmm. so that that has pretty much quite helped in um the social distancing right now the issue which is not really that much but it's probably like how do we reach out to rural areas or to um unfortunately people who are like elderly like someone in that is at um age 50 and above, what we realize from all of the pictures is that um, these age groups are the one that is the hardest to get them to do social distancing. Because yeah. I, I don't know, maybe there is, a, there is an issue of them understanding the concept of social distancing. Mm -hmm. um, so which, which was what we did was, I mean, on my side, we decided not to use the word social distancing. It's just something that use like simple words that normal people would understand, like from, you know, people from the, the, the highest intellect to probably like people on the streets. So instead of saying social distancing, we just say stay at home. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Don't, you know, it's, because social distancing, it's a very abstract concept and not yeah. many people would understand. It's so we just say, uh... yeah. I mean by that because actually social distancing we are trying to say that don't go out uh, don't uh, be too near to another person exactly. but uh, at the same time we are encouraging to be social active because uh, we are social animals and we need that yeah. social um, so i completely get your point actually yeah so what we do is we just tell people like stay at home even the, the prime minister currently like his tagline is um duduk diam diam which is like sit quietly <laughs> And mm -hmm. it's like, sit quietly, stay at home, you know, maintain one meter away from people. Mm -hmm. So it's about like verbalizing and like giving like a visual representation of what is social distancing. And mm -hmm. like hopefully with like a lot of repetition and then people will start to follow. So that's how we did it here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, it's uh, good to hear that actually. Um, and yeah, I had, I had those uh, live sessions uh, before and we were all agreeing in that uh, we should not call it social dis distancing, but physical distancing because it makes more sense. So um, yeah, I totally agree with you, Amy. So um, what we can figure out is that communication is a key point in uh, all these situations and it should happen in, uh, within mutual understanding uh, of the government and the public. And I really hope that the public also uh, responds well because the government is putting a lot of effort each and every all around the world. And I see publics like uh, Singapore or Kuala Lumpur or everywhere else that they are corresponding. And uh, I really am looking forward that the same thing is happening in Pakistan. And there are some people who are actually getting into it. It took them a bit time to take the actual thing serious, but they are now into it and they are actually getting more serious about it. And um, 
they are uh, implementing social distancing and all these things. So um, as I said, commun communication is the key. So um, while we are social distancing, we have a privilege, our generation, because we never have observed such a, a pandemic. But we have the uh, privilege of uh, technology. We can communicate. We are communicating, although we are so far away from each other. So um, how you think uh, this um, might turn out to be? Because now a lot of people are switching from the, those manual things like work and institution schools are shut down to those online virtual classes. So can you explain me how it is in Kuala Lumpur right now? Well, I think people are adapting. Um, I see that a lot of, if we were to follow the social media deep stick, like a lot of people are posting up how they are coping with their work from home. Mm -hmm. And um, you, you see, you start seeing um, organic posts such as like, how do you work from home with kids at home? Mm -hmm. And you know, things like that. So it's, it's very much um, community based mm -hmm. um, PSA as well, like I would say um, that people are, people are banding together and then giving tips on how to, what to do staying at home, like how do you keep your sanity staying at home, how, how do you, you know, um, effectively work from home, um, regardless of whether you know you're married or you're not married, but um, I think people, are, the younger generations are taking it in good strides. Um, mm -hmm. And I actually, at workplace even, like people, uh, the, the L, maybe someone from Gen X are also embracing the technology. So I, I don't see much um, issues on working from home. It's mm -hmm. still like, there are some people who are saying that, you know, working from home is a lot more tougher, but people are adapting to it. Yeah. Okay, great. Sahib, can you tell me uh, how is it in Singapore, how people are coping with uh, using more that technology and using those virtual platforms to communicate and to actually uh, live their life on those platforms, like uh, having meetings, having their work done, uh, institutes are giving those online classes. Uh, can you tell me something about that, please? Sure, sure. Um, so look, I think uh, in Singapore, uh, a lot of the, the multinational companies effectively uh, employed a 50% a of the office comes to work whilst the other 50% stays at home strategy. Okay. Uh, um, and the reason behind that was, uh, it was kind of a part of the business continu continuity plan. Um, uh, and then as the situation started to get worse, uh, it pretty much progressed to everyone working from home. Um, so now, obviously, working from home involves a lot of video conference calls. Um, it involves a lot of communication over, over various, um, over WhatsApp and Slack, etc. cetera. Um, I'd say on the whole, uh, you know, it has worked okay. Um, mm -hmm. I think uh, there's one thing that, you know, we, we, you guys mentioned before. Um, if people don't feel like they are having enough contact with other, uh, other people, um, yeah. they can tend to feel very lonely uh, and very isolated, especially mm -hmm. if they're spending most of their days indoors. Um, and so, you know, one, one policy that we've done in, in my company is that we do a, um, a kind of a 15 minute catch up uh, daily um, as a team. Uh, I mean, there's only 10 of us in the office. We do a 15 minute catch up where everyone basically just gives a quick update about how they're doing, what, how they're feeling, uh, you know, how, what, what, how they spend their, their free time. And it just gives people a way of, of you know, um, interacting with one another uh, and, and feeling less lonely, um, mm -hmm. which I think is, is a big risk uh, with this whole working from home um, way of doing things. So I think that is, that, is, that is something that I think a lot of companies have started to do and, and more companies should consider doing. Because I think you know, one of the, the big risks here is that people's morale 
uh, as an employee or as a person kind of kind of drops uh, as this crisis worsens uh, and, and that, okay. that could have a lot more long-term damaging impact. Yeah, it, it makes completely sense actually what you say because people will get too much comfortable kind of if I can say it like this because if you're in an office you are given to the one a certain uh, environment and now you're at your home like hanging around and then having those um, meetups uh, when you quickly just uh, get a meeting there. So yeah, I completely understand your point. So as we are doing uh, to do a lot of communication, it doesn't just happen uh, through uh, from a government or to the public. It also is happening from those news channels and through those social media. And um, now what we are dealing also with in this crisis, uh, which I could nearly call another crisis is misinformation, fake news. So um, how has the government deal with it or what have you observed how people are actually, um, uh, how are they reacting to this? How uh, do they try to avoid such uh, fake news? Uh, Amy or, no, sorry, Sahib, can you continue? Sure, happy to. So look, again, I think Singapore is um, a bit of an outlier here, uh, but the, the government has basically, um, used, uh, you know, implemented, a, you know, a new online uh, fake news or falsehood uh, law to basically correct any misinformation in, in various posts on social media about the coronavirus. Uh, now, look, you can argue that that is giving the government way too much authority to, to censor uh, the population and, and it's a, it's a, uh, deterioration in, in the freedom of speech uh, mm -hmm. but uh, you know on the other hand you could also argue that it is definitely reducing the spread of, fo of, of false information uh, spreading, which I think is a big issue in, in various countries today um, you know India I think is, is, is a great example of a country where there's a lot of fake news spreading um, mm -hmm. so look, look I think Singapore is gonna you're always going to tread this thin line between uh, too much censorship versus, um, you know, the government uh, doing what's in the best interest of the people. Um, but I think on the whole, uh, we've had less of an issue with, with fake news spreading um, in Singapore. Oh, okay. Okay. Uh, Amy, can you tell me something about uh, how you, your people, how the government and uh, the common people are dealing with misinformation? Okay, I think uh, what the government is doing is pretty similar. They're using social media to combat the uh, fake news. So they use um, social, uh, they use Facebook and they also use Telegram. So every time that there are any news circulating, the Telegram is very fast to react. So they will be like, oh, this is fake news and all that. And um, other than just leaving it at that, they are also penalizing people who create the fake news. So today they were saying that um, 44 cases are opened to start, um, you know, uh, penalizing people who are spreading the fake news. So oh. it's it's something that they are doing actively at the same point. So that's the government side. On the community side, at least um, from what I'm trying to do is we're trying to do this um, sort of like a um, an experiment sort of what we're doing is uh, I'm actually identifying uh, leaders, community leaders mm -hmm. uh, from all over, especially from areas that is hard to reach um, with internet. So I'm getting um, community leaders, uh, pre uh, preachers, um, you know, um, village heads, or just like normal people who seems to have like this um, influence, especially when they are in the category of um, 50 and above, because like these are the people who, who like is more vulnerable to misinformation. And we're getting, we're identifying them, and we have identified certain uh, a few across Malaysia, and we are feeding them with information, so that it like it's no point like talking to them about fake news and then why is fake news bad and all that. But we are feeding them directly this information, and they felt like like hey, I am currently I, I'm getting the news from 
the the first source so and then they will have this like um sort of motivation to spread it to their community so oh, okay. it's it's still yeah because social media is fine if you are working with people uh, in areas that has internet coverage but what about people who don't have internet coverage so how are you going to 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 get to them or they might have internet coverage but they're just not on social media they're just not on telegram and all that they're not tech savvy so how do you just keep on feeding them information so that they do not spread other fake information so that's what we're trying to, we're doing right now ah that's that's a great initiative Yeah, we uh, our hub has some similar initiative to avoid actually misinformation. What we think is the best uh, way to um, is to communicate actually the information which is provided, for example, by the WHO or the Global Shippers Community in the local language to the common people, because most most of them are not as much as educated or cannot like uh, they are educated but because it's not the first language they don't understand it properly yeah. so um we are like uh, translating those posts into our local language urdu and then uh, like posting them on our social media and encouraging uh, encouraging uh, influencers to post them on their social media so that we can reach out to as many people as we can so yeah. um but uh, but it's another good point you told me uh, it's a completely different angle to uh, you told me you are just uh, your government is just not looking for the misinformation and correcting it but also looking for the people who are spreading it so like to eliminate the roots that's another uh, very nice point and i haven't uh, seen this uh, happening like this before so yeah that's uh, a great point amy thank you So um yeah while being by hub works uh, like i mentioned we are uh, translating those informations we are translating those awareness into our local language uh, is there anything uh, specific or similar that your hub is doing well not in our English hub English? but like we are doing translations um number we are up to like 20 different languages and dialects in uh, Malaysia so that's one of the things that i'm working on on our hub um we because of this you know 20, 250 billion stimulus package that we get and then there will be a lot of cash handouts especially to the b40s to the low incomers um what we are anticipating is uh, the how are they going to manage their money So on our help site is we're also doing PSAs on how can you manage your finance, and it has to be wow. and it is in like the most simplest um way possible. Um, the mm -hmm. the whole idea is to educate uh the B forties and some of the middle class um citizens on um the right way because times are going to be bad and one of the ways for you to um pat your um, financial situation is to manage it so while mm -hmm. you know you're getting all these handouts that's nice but you're going to finish it in like that if you're not careful yeah. so we, we're working on some um some information on that other than the usual psa on mental health and um you know uh, fillers on information on covid but um that's something that we are doing Yeah, that's that's a great thing because I think uh, this will lead uh, to ultimate no wastage of the finance, which is really really important in these crucial times. Uh, Sahib, uh, can you tell me uh, what your hub is uh, taking for activities uh, regarding the coronavirus right now? Sure, happy to. Um, so look, we have been um, looking at what uh, other hubs. Have been doing around the world um, mm -hmm. we uh, we did a call last week um, as a hub and uh, we decided to focus on a number of areas um, we basically said that look, we, we already work with a few partner organizations as uh, so for example we work with a lot of uh, we work with a charity that that works with um, foreign domestic workers in, in Singapore So we uh, reached out to them and we are supporting them with um, with uh, various uh, activities that, that enable these foreign domestic workers to keep uh, earning their their incomes. Um, we have also um, 
started to work on uh, creating a centralized database uh, for the small businesses in Singapore uh, mm -hmm. so that they know exactly what grants are available to them. Um, you know, in, in times like these, these small businesses are going to go through various cash flow issues. And so we think that by creating a centralized database uh, where they can see all of, all of the grants that are available to them, uh, that would help them in this, uh, in this current situation. Mm -hmm. uh, we are also working on um, uh, basically co collating uh, the insights of various experts in the business mm -hmm. world uh, to essentially develop a thought leadership piece around what the future of business would look like uh, mm -hmm. in this new world of coronavirus, given that you know, consumer behavior, uh, behavior by consumers has changed fundamentally over the last uh, few months. So how, how can businesses better adapt to this situation? Uh, so we're working on that as well. And finally, uh, one last thing is we are working on putting together a portal which um, allows the various food and beverage businesses in Singapore um, to, to redeem vouchers. Uh, so customers can buy vouchers basically right now and in order to be redeemed in the future. Uh, and it basically allows these food and beverage businesses to uh, mitigate some of their cash flow issues that they are currently facing. Uh, and we have borrowed the example of the, of the, of the Rome hub um, when we, when we uh, thought of this. So um, we, we have, overall, we're looking at what other hubs are doing and, and leaning on them and, um, and trying to develop our own strategy for, for dealing with the situation. Yeah, it's great to see how active the hubs have came all around the world. And yeah, let me tell you something about our hubs activities. So apart from like these live sessions that I'm having, uh, like conducting those region-wide live sessions and those translation of awareness, but we also um, have uh, or are about to start a campaign on mental health during this uh, pandemic and uh, that uh, fellow hub member of Fesaban Hub will be conducting live sessions on how to deal with the current situation and uh, how to cope with it and what uh, activities can be done and, and such like topics. And apart from that, we uh, are uh, also starting another campaign, a food drive campaign, because there are a lot of people here who um, can't afford, like because they can't go out and earn their money, they don't have any income. So they are uh, getting uh, like, uh, empty from their homes, from the kitchen. So what we are doing is we are providing them with those basic needs like salt, sugar, and all these things so that they can keep like um, feeding their families so that they at least get like two times a day something to eat. Yeah, and uh, as a third activity that we have uh, started was like we produced like uh, 50K um, hand sanitizers and um, we provided them amongst those common people and yeah, we produced them uh, among, alongside with local authorities uh, according to the WHO formula. So um, that was very, very necessary because our country is currently on shortage of um, masks and hand sanitizers. So what I want to know right now, Sahad, is, uh, is there any kind of sh a similar shortage in your country? Because we are seeing in Western countries a shortage of toilet paper, for example. So um, is there anything uh, similar in uh, Singapore? Yeah, it's, uh, it's interesting. I think, you know, in the early days when this virus started uh, breaking in Singapore, this was, I guess, late January, early, a few people were quite, quite and long queues in grocery stores and you would see empty shelves uh, around. Um, and there were definite, I think, shortages of, of face masks, uh, hand sanitizer, uh, various grocery items, toilet paper. But I think if you look at the situation now, uh, I'd say that people are generally uh, not panicking as much. And so 
uh, there are, I'd say most items are, are readily available. I think face masks are still under, you know, under some short shortage. Um, but I'd say most items are readily available. Uh, and again, I think the government has done a great job there in ensuring that people do not panic and mm -hmm. are not hoarding uh, food and particular uh, items. So I think overall, again, uh, we went through a phase of, of panic, uh, but today we are, are generally okay in terms of, of most uh, grocery items and other household goods. Okay, good, good to know that. Amy, can you tell me something about um, uh, there in Kuala Lumpur? Do you have to face uh, any shortage like these uh, currently mentioned? Oh, we can't hear you. Wait. Okay. Can you hear uh, me? Can you please, uh, uh, yeah. Hold on. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. All right. So, um, well, Yes, we can. Well, food-wise, uh, there's not much shortage because what happened was there was only panic buying on the day before um, our MCO was enforced. But after that, I guess people, uh, I mean, a few days after that, people start seeing that, you know, food is still a lot, like it's not going to go anywhere. So people have calmed down. Um, on mask, we have an issue of one, because of the short. Uh, the shortages that there are people, there are scammers and there are people who are selling it at exorbitant price and government is clamping down on that. Um, okay. They have actually caught like one guy having 300,000 units of face masks mm -hmm. um, and like uh, they're also clamping on other uh, people online and then even the community uh, what's funny was people started viral uh, someone just came up with a list of fake um, scammers or people who are selling at a very high ridiculous price and they are sharing it online so it's the community also uh, like having a lockdown on all these people um, on shortages on the healthcare side um, there have been a few um, hospitals asking for PPEs and um, surgical masks, uh, but I think the uh, situation has calmed down. But what is cool is that um, there is this one initiative. Uh, I can't remember what's the name. I think it's called FaceSight or something. So it's a group of people who owns 3D printing. And ah. they kind of like combined like the whole uh, anyone who has like three D printers in Malaysia, they gathered and then they started um, moving resources among themselves. So like let's say if Penang has so many people in print uh, that has three D printers, but we need it more mm -hmm. in KL because there's more hospitals and then the hospitals are running on shortages. So they actually courier their three D printers into certain, they've already like um, come up with like certain hotspots that they want to put in, which is like very close to the hospital. And then they can just like start producing um, wow. the face shields. So that's like one of the cool things that they're doing. And then right now they are um, doing respirators as well, mm -hmm. just to like possibly help in case like the hospitals do not have enough respirators. So that's one of the cool things that I see. Um, and then to help out the people, the, the people who might be marginalized, like the refugees, the foreign workers, the, the poorer people, um, we came, someone came up with this Facebook group called Caremongers, where mm -hmm. people can just offer and people can also ask for whatever that they need. So some people were like, oh, you know, I lost my job. Um, because I, I, I have daily income and then right now I, I don't have daily incomes. So um, they're asking like, can someone, you know, help me out with getting rice or like basic necessities and people are just coming. Um, so that we have that. And then right now they are reorganizing like um, a friend of mine and me, what we're planning to do is we're trying to make it centralized and mm -hmm. um, put it in a more, uh, uh, so we have this website where you can click if you are offering or if you are searching for and then anyone who wants to help out can just click and then like okay it's yellow it's currently being 
helped and then once you completed it and then it's like it will turn red so you don't have to help them anymore so it's a little bit more organized so that's something that we are working on yeah yeah um i definitely agree with you on the point that people are taking a disadvantage of the critical situation right now uh, we uh, what i have observed was like when the first cases came uh, into pakistan it was like that um the prices of the masks and the hand sanitizers, uh, they just increased so much, like even double or triple was is like pretty less to say. It was 10 times more like approximately. And um, yeah, that, uh, that was like really not okay, especially not morally, it was not all right. But yeah, <laughs> now everything is coming uh, to uh, normal if I can say because the government is like also taking action against those people so yeah um, moving on to the economy can you tell me something about the economy in uh, Kuala Lumpur what kind of impact did uh, the COVID-19 had on the economy it's more towards the SMEs the SMEs are badly uh, impacted because you know they're on a lockdown and then it's not going to end once the MCO is done like you will see the repercussions in the next few months or who knows even next year. So, um, but right now, mm -hmm. because everyone is staying in, so they don't feel the pinch yet. Um, but uh, the the one that is hit the worst are probably people who has daily incomes, like um, Grab uh, drivers, taxi drivers. Uh, people who are in yeah. labor, hard labor, so they are affected. Yeah. So um, the government is looking into uh, even the homeless people. So the yeah. government do take a look into that. But of course, there's always people who just kind of slip through the system. Um, but luckily yeah. enough, um, Malaysians are the type that are very proactive in this. Like uh, And like there are people who are trying to help as much as we can. Ah, and uh, you just mentioned those people who uh, don't have that much income or those SMEs. So uh, how is the government dealing with those? Uh, like, are there uh, financial packages for them, like as the most governments are providing? Or uh, how is it in Kuala Lumpur? Well, for during the MCO period, what they're doing is that um, they have centers so that where people, if they don't have enough food, they can just go to the centers or call the hotline first and then they will sort things out on the government side. And then for the homeless, uh, they actually have shelter areas um, for them. Uh, we call it the transit centers. Um, so the transit centers are fully operating right now. Uh, it's just that uh, soup kitchens are saying that that's fine for like homeless people who can walk to those places. But what about people who are probably more frail? Um, what are they going to do? So um, the, what do you call that? The NGOs, the, the non-profits are there to also assist um, where, mm -hmm. wherever anyone has, you know, people who got slipped out of the system. Yeah. But um, moving forward from MCO, uh, we have that economic stimulus package. Uh -huh. yeah. So government is sending out like for every household income that is under B40, um, they get like 1,600 ringgit per household. Uh -huh. And then people who are single, there's um, like a one of 600. Um, there's deferment of loans. There's, um, there's a few things that um, the government has came up. Oh, one interesting thing is also um, a free insurance package for uh, people who uh, an annual income is less than 100,000 ringgit. So the government wow. is um, coming up with like an, it's called My Salam, which is an insurance for, for the public. And let's say yeah. if you are down with COVID, uh, the government will pay 50 ringgit per day whenever you are awarded. Okay, good, good to know that. So, um, <clears throat> Sahib? Hi, can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. So, uh, Sahib, we were talking about, about the impact on the economy that um, COVID-19 uh, had uh, in particular regions. So, can you tell us about Singapore? Was there some, uh, obviously, uh, there was something to observe um, 
in uh, the economy, some fluctuations. So sorry, uh, the connection, but if I understood your question. Hello? Uh, Sahib, I guess your um, connections are. Hi, can you poor. hear me? Hi, yes. sorry. Can you hear <laughs> no, me? Yeah, I can hear you. Can you hear me? Uh, yeah. yeah, sorry, yes, I can hear you now. Uh, okay, so if you could just, sorry, if you could just repeat the question very quickly. Yeah, sure. So I was asking Amy, and I would like to know uh, from your point of view, like what kind of impact uh, did uh, the economy suffer from COVID-19? Uh, did you observe any fluctuations or are there any facts or figures that you could like sh uh, share with us? Okay, I guess, okay, we will wait uh, for Sahe, but we can continue, Amy, I can continue with you, and then uh, he might be joining us later on. So uh, we just discussed the economy there in Kuala Lumpur. So, um, yeah, so we have seen that since COVID-19 was uh, discovered, uh, all the schools and institutes like universities and colleges were shut down. So, um, how was the uh, how is it in Kuala Lumpur? Are they shut down too? And um, if they are shut down, I would like to know uh, how the government is uh, now imposing education within uh, the people. Like, how is it uh, supposed to continue for the students? The uh, MCO is actually, um, the timing was quite nice because it coincides with the school holidays. So we don't really necessarily lose 28 days of learning, but it's probably, I don't know, um, like lesser than that, like probably just 14 days, probably just two weeks of um, loss of lessons. But the uh, Ministry of Education actually came up with um like modules like on online um workbooks that the students can do during the 28 days of mco so for every levels um there's a workbook mm -hmm. that they can do at home so that's why not mitigating um the loss of like physical lessons that they have with teachers of course some people that is homeschooled that, that that's a, a different matter uh, and then the national library they opened up their uh, um, what do you call that their catalog of ebooks so there's about i think 3 million or 30 million yeah. of books ebooks um, for free for people to to uh, load during uh, the mco so that's one of the things Ah, okay, good. So, uh, Sahib, uh, I would like to know what kind of impact COVID-19 um, did uh, had on the education system in Singapore. Can you tell me something about that, please? Sure. Um, okay. So, look, I think, um, I think the first thing to say there is that uh, schools in Singapore are still running uh, pretty much normally. Uh -huh. uh, what uh, what has happened recently is that uh, the government has announced that most schools will now move to one day of, of home learning, um, but oh. essentially uh, the remaining four days in the week, uh, they will all children will remain in school. Mm -hmm. uh, I think this is this is a way of uh, getting of children prepared and, and, and parents prepared for eventually maybe work, uh, learning from home and uh, studying from home. Uh, but uh -huh. schools at the moment are still still functioning. Um, and I think a large reason for that is that uh, this virus does not seem to be spreading uh, amongst children. 
um, and, and to date it mm -hmm. seems like children are relatively unaffected uh, by this virus. Uh, so the, the government has, has allowed schools to still function fairly normally. Okay. Um, so, yeah. Uh, okay. Good to know that. And um, apart from that, I asked Amy earlier. That was actually the question for you. Uh, what about the economy in uh, Singapore? What can you tell me about that? Uh, was there any kind of uh, impact uh, after COVID nineteen on the economy? Sure. Uh, yeah, so look, I think uh, it's fair to say that the economy has taken a, a quite a significant hit. Um, I think most people are think that the, we will move into a recession and that the um, Singaporean economy will contract by uh, between 1% and 4% uh, over this year. Um, look, I, I think that uh, people are kind of bracing for this, for this recession overall, um, I think. Uh, we're also seeing that um, you know the, the trade volumes uh, have, have started to decline quite significantly. And Singapore, being a major trading hub for Asia, um, will will definitely um, will definitely bear the brunt of, of a lot of that of the of the drop in trading volumes. Uh, and I think another thing that's obviously going to hit Singapore very hardly is uh, very hard is is this collapse in oil prices. Um, which we, you know, we, I think we've kind of yet to see the, the full impact of that. Um, but I think you know, in, in many ways, Singapore has mm -hmm. kind of been hit in all directions um, in what in terms of what's going on in the world right now. Um, so yeah, the, the economy is due to contract. But as I mentioned before, uh, the government has announced uh, quite a significant stimulus package of fifty-five billion dollars. So hopefully that will try and um, that hopefully that will mitigate some of the uh, the, the negative impacts of this of this downturn. Yeah, um, a quick question. Can you or do you know about how the package is going to be implemented within the people? Like how is it going to be distributed? Do you have any idea of this? Sure. So look, I think the details are kind of yet to be uh, announced. But I'd say um, overall, you know, a lot of money is obviously going towards um, the hospitals and the healthcare facilities. Uh, a lot of money is going towards um, enabling that, uh, you know, lower income people, um, you know, maintain their jobs uh, and maintain their, their income. Um, mm -hmm. And I think a lot of money is also going towards helping the small businesses in Singapore operate. Um, so, uh, yeah, I, I'd say that, that that's largely uh, where the money will go. Okay, good, great. Okay, um, Amy, I would like to know what kind of impact uh, the whole scenario had on your life. Like, a lot of uh, life cycles have been disturbed by this. Um, so, um, how was it for you? I mean, you are maybe, uh, you're probably a working lady. So, can you tell me, like, what kind of impact did uh, the whole thing had on you? Well... Well, first of all, I think social wise, nothing has changed because I'm a bit of an introvert. So this is like perfect for me. Uh, but I do miss social interaction um, with my friends. So um, I think the, the interesting thing is that you, you seem to connect more with more people now that you have more time. So it's like, you know, you're, re you're reconnecting and then you're doing fun stuff with your friends. Like I had a virtual museum, like walk through with my friends, like what we're on the laptop looking at it. And then like we're on the phone and, you know, we're just like, you, you know, talking about like any piece of art. So that's that. Um, but I think future work wise, because I'm a marketing consultant. So, and most of the time I work either um, remotely or with, uh, sorry, remotely or with at my client's place. Uh, for now, it seems like it is uncertain, but I'm optimistic because looking at how things are, especially for SMEs, there's, there's definitely op opportunities for me. It's just that I have to just lay down my strategy wise. 
um, yeah, it, it has been, um, I think it has been a reflective time for a lot of people um, mm -hmm. during this MCO because uh, somehow you are forced to to have more time with yourself. I think mm -hmm. that's, I mean, if we have a silver lining, let's let's just agree that we have more time with ourselves to, I guess, figure it out. Like Mother Nature kind of had a clamp down on us. So, yeah. Well, so you think this is a positive point or a negative point that you have now more spare oh. time? Moving forward, times are probably going to be generally bad for a lot of people. No, um, I mean, but... more spare time for yourself. You think it's a positive aspect uh, on your opinion or it's more negative? Because you I don't know what, for example. Um, I, I, okay, it makes me sound very privileged, but yeah, it has been probably been a more positive experience for me. Okay. No, that's something I hear from everyone, actually, uh, mm -hmm. that it, it is the most positive thing that you, what, what is coming out actually from this current situation, that they have more time for themselves, they can do things they didn't have time for, and um, yeah, that they have time to reflect themselves, actually. So uh, you tell me about yours. I spent a lot of my time in webinars. Mm -hmm. um, strategizing on things that I will do once you know MCO MCO is done. In fact, probably during MCO, um, I got to read more often. That's something that like it has been a while. Um, yeah, that's one of the some of the things. Yeah, great. Yeah, Sahib, uh, can you tell me what kind of impact um, your life is having? Uh, due to this the scenario right now, like uh, kind of your routines have changed and how are you making use of the spare time? Yeah, um, look, I think uh, this, this virus has, has had, uh, has meant that we've all had to kind of adapt to our lifestyles um, and we can't, uh, we can't really do everything that we, we, we would normally do. Um, so for me personally, you know, uh, one one change that I've tried to make is um, I'm now cooking more often at home. Um, mm -hmm. I am um, I'm also uh, you know uh, learning new languages. Um, I have also um, decided that you know uh, in order to avoid getting cabin fever, sitting at home all day, uh, I try to um, you know go outdoors to do some daily uh, to do some exercise, like going for a run. Um, and I think that is that has been very helpful for me. Um, and I think uh, other than that, I think it's also you know living in Singapore um, and my family living back in the UK. Uh, you know, one thing I try to do is I try to try to talk to them as often as possible. Um, and I think that's important to you know stay in touch with with your loved ones. Um, so that, that's something I've been doing. I think uh, that has been working out quite well for me. Yeah, and you think what kind of, you, what you feel like, is this a more positive aspect or is it more like negative for you to have more spare time? Uh, so look, I think it's, it's balanced. I think that uh, this, I'd say overall, it's probably negative. Um, because I, I'm someone who, who likes to be uh, outdoors a lot and, and doing things and interacting with a lot of people. Um, but I think one thing, um, the positive that, you know, as you said, uh, it, it gives you a chance to reflect more and, um, and to, you know, appreciate the, the, the more, uh, you know, spending more time at home and, 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 doing, and doing things like reading and cooking. Um, so there, there's always a silver lining, mm -hmm. um, and I, I think uh, it's important to remember that. Yeah, great, yeah. great to hear that. Yeah, basically, like, what I can do is nothing, because I am a student myself, and I am yet not sure if I could continue studying or not, because there is no foreseeable exam. So, yeah, it's, um, but it's great, because we have no more time to do things that I couldn't do, like I'm connecting to you people, like this is an opportunity that I would most probably not have. So um, yeah, that's an amazing thing actually. 
So um, I think we are at the very, very end of our conversation. So um, Amy, I would like to know, like, uh, do you have any specific message to the people who are watching us right now or generally what you would like to say to the people right now in this current situation? Um, I think most importantly, now is the time for us not to be individualistic. Um, it's very mm -hmm. important that we also think about others um, in whatever decisions mm -hmm. that we were going to make. And um, just for a couple of weeks, um, try to comply to the authorities. There is mm -hmm. a reason why so social distancing is important. And, you know, from countries to countries, it might differ in terms of like the strictness of it. But do know that it is um, at the best interest of the community at large. Yeah, great. Tahib, your last words to the people, uh, what would you like to say? Oh, wait, wait, you are on mute. Okay, now you can talk. Okay, perfect. Uh, look, I, I, I think uh, pretty much everyone around the world now has, has started to take this virus very seriously, uh, and it should be taken very seriously. Um, I think that before there was a time where a lot of young people felt like this was not something that could affect them. Uh, it is absolutely something that affects you, and more importantly, it is absolutely something that uh, can affect your parents and grandparents. Um, so my first piece of advice is please do take this virus seriously, uh, do practice social distancing. Um, and I guess secondly uh, is my, my piece of advice is to, to stay positive. Um, and, you know, we will get through this difficult time. Um, and, uh, you know, we will, there will be many opportunities that will come out of this. Um, and uh, it's important that we, we focus on our own mental health um, and uh, in keeping, ensuring that our, our loved ones are also um, maintaining, keeping happy. So uh, yeah, take the virus seriously and, and stay positive. Yeah, thank you so much for sure. I agree with both of you. And um, I also feel like it's of major importance that people actually correspond uh, with the government and uh, try to implement those measures because there is a specific reason why the measures are implementing. So uh, just listen to them. Just don't go out because uh, if you uh, are not, uh, if you can be infected, but you might not be like, uh, you might be young, but it also means that you can carry the disease and you can carry them to someone uh, who is close to you, your parents, your grandparents or someone else. So please uh, stay at home, stay safe. And uh, thanks to both of you for joining me today. It was amazing, a, a very interesting conversation. I heard points uh, from the point of view of the government I didn't hear before. So that was pretty interesting for me. And um, yeah, thank you very, very much. And I hope you stay healthy and safe. And um, yeah, that's it for today. All right. Thank you very thank much. Thank you for having Bye. 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 <laughs>